This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode 39, recorded on August 9th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today, from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hi there. How are you? How are you doing? All is well in New York? Uh, It's pretty hot here, but otherwise it's fine. Mm. It's not 72 degrees like it is there. Actually, we have more like like 80-something. We have the air conditioner on, which you believe it's seldom un- happens. It's unusual. Yeah. Well, usually we have the air on in August here in New York, but it's off here at Columbia because they're fixing it. Oh, great. It's pretty hot here. But I was, uh, you know, my ancestors are from southern Italy, so I don't mind the heat <laughs> at all. It doesn't bother me. You think it's genetic, huh? I definitely think it's genetic. <laughs> Absolutely. Also joining us today from... The Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, Vincent and Elio. Is it hot down there? No, it's actually pleasant. We've had uh, probably two weeks of of rain. Every day it's rained uh, either in the morning or the afternoon, and it's actually tempered our temperature. Hmm. You're lucky. So you don't have a drought down there. Uh, South Carolina is in a drought, but the coast, because of, you know, the moisture coming in off of the Gulf and Mm. the temperature change because of the water, it, it mercifully dumps rain on us. And, uh, we're lucky there were, once you go about 50 miles inland, it, it reverts back to what the Eastern half of the United States has been facing for these last months of no water. Yeah. I was in Madison a couple of weeks ago, and it is bone dry out there. Everything is brown. It's amazing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's really bad. But today we have something a little bit different. We like we like to mix things up here on on Twim, keep everyone uh, on their toes. So we're actually going to talk about a a little book that was published not too long ago by the American Society for Microbiology Press. It's called Microbes and Evolution. The World That Darwin Never Saw, and it is a collection of essays. It's edited by Roberto Coulter and Stanley Malloy, and the the genesis of this book uh, came back in, in 2009, which was the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth, and there was a colloquium uh, on microbial evolution organized in the Galapagos Islands, appropriate, and uh, from that colloquium arose the idea, I think, casually, uh, for to ask scientists to write short personal essays about their work. And these essays would showcase their enthusiasm for their work and also the impact of uh, microbes on evolution. And the idea was that these essays would be simple, accessible to the general public. Didn't you think they were really written in a beautifully personal style and Very not personal. all but most of them really worked don't you think yeah it's unusual and they're all personal the one I, the ones i have read you know it's what i did and how i fell That's into right. this yeah. it's really very good and, and also they well i like to say think that maybe it's the turtles on the galapagos that got him to come out of the shell <laughs> 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 scientists don't usually write this way it's an, it's an unusual book isn't it it's very unusual i've never i've never seen it say i've seen bo- Essays, or maybe whole books of people writing about science, their science in a personal way. But the compendium of this, a sort of a collection, seems uh, quite unusual. I don't know if there's anything like it that's ever been written. No, and also what's really unusual is the price. It's only fourteen ninety five. <laughs> yeah, isn't it incredible? So I, everyone, it's, could... it's what it's uh, two hundred ninety pages, so it's yeah. quite rich. So you will learn, you know, what motivated these individuals to do their work, and also you learn science as well, and it's pretty straightforward. I refer to it as our summer beach reading. It, it it really is a nice beach book. You can take it to the beach with you, and if it falls in the water, you can shake it off and not worry about you know damaging a a, a major tome. 
an expensive book. Or a piece of electronic yeah. equipment, right? Or a piece of elect. Oh, and it's also available <laughs> electronically. It if is, if you yeah. want to get it on your Kindle or iPad, you can do that as well. So it's uh, it's absolutely fascinating. There's all sorts of really cool stories. But I think a lot of credit goes to the editors because it's really their vision thing that probably helped the authors come out of their shells. It must have beaten everybody over the head. Uh, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> Whenever you have a collection like this, it's so hard to get everyone to get their chapter in, as everyone knows. So This is probably why it took a while for the book to appear, but it doesn't matter because it's timeless in a way. It's yeah. just not, not, not. And so we thought we would, um, we each picked a, a chapter and we're going to chat about it as a way of getting you excited. Before, before we do that, let, let me, can I make a generalization? Yeah, you know, I like to make generalization. So I was thinking, what is it that microbes contribute to, to evolution? And um, we can talk about many things. But the, the one thing that's outstanding is that we have a totally different concept of evolution than Darwin had, who, even though he didn't talk about mutations, more or less set the stage for thinking that single mutations are selected for, and that gradually that becomes a different organism, a species, right? That's sort of what I think, in fact, the, what was it called? The great synthesis or something like that. It was, there was a time when people said, let's put gene what we know about genetics together with evolution, and this is the idea. Well, it, there's always been a problem with it. And you know, there's a problem that comes up, in fact, uh, in the... Um, the discussion that people bring up with creationism, how can you make something so complex? Well, it turns out that this is probably not the biggest force in evolution. The biggest force in evolution is the acquisition of whole packages of genes. Modular evolution, I think it's called. Where, um, like, well, the best example, of course, the acquisition of whole bacteria that became mitochondria and chloroplasts. So you didn't... You didn't figure out uh, how to do it gene by gene, although the original cell may have done that. But the, the actual, the, the summation, the, the product of it is something quite different in terms of the, the mechanism. And I think that's really a big deal. Mm -hmm. Gives a whole new meaning to the, the evolutionary phrase, punctuated equilibrium. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You, you punctuate when you acquire a whole bunch of genes at the same time. And you can have a module, well, there is... And in this book, in fact, Kelly Hughes discusses this from the point of view of how flagella made, because flagella are so complicated. They can take about, what, 40 genes or something. Uh, and people on that side uh, claim that this is irreducible complexity. Well, it's not, because it's simply a modular arrangement where a packet of genes from one function has been borrowed to do something else and put together with another packet. And this, this is... Uh, it's far from irreducible. It makes a lot of sense. What, what, I, what I find interesting is that, of course, Darwin knew nothing about microbes. He, uh, yeah. he, he worked at the beginning of the 1800s where we still hadn't figured out about them. Pasteur hadn't done his work yet, and Robert Koch hadn't been around. So this would be, if he picked up this book today, he would be amazed, right? So, Elia, why don't you go first and tell us... Um, Okay. About your chapter. Well, the chapter that I enjoyed is by Cameron Curry, who's a, what is he? He's an entomologist, ecologist, evolutionary person, and a microbiologist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he works about a subject which is just lovely, lovely subject for summer reading, namely ants and fungi. <laughs> he talks about the uh, fungus cultivating ants, also known as the leaf cutting ants, which I think anybody who watches television has seen more than once on some National Geographic program or something like that, something on nature. The story is about the uh, ants that go out and gather bits of vegetation, leaves, sometimes flowers, and carry them back to the nest. And uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? I think almost everybody has seen this. You go to a zoo, and sometimes they have an exhibit of that in, you, in front of your eyes. So what this is about is examples of evolution that go into several dimensions. And um, actually, can I, I, can I read what he, he quotes from Darwin from Original Species? And let me read the, the sort of introduction to his chapter. It is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms 
crawling through the damp earth and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner have all been produced by laws acting around us. And this apparently is a quote that is known as the Tangle Bank quote, which is very descriptive of really what happens out there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Or even in there. I mean, this quote can be used for the microbiome. Oh, of course. Exactly. Well, good point. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You can use it because here you have it. And the interesting thing is that it's all been produced by laws acting around us. And it's our job to figure out, <clears throat> at least in part, what these laws are. Anyhow, leaf cutting ants. If you go to the trop tropical America, south of Texas, including parts of Texas, and south of there, all the way to Argentina, and you go into the forest, you will find trails where the vegetation seems to be denuded and what you what is if you look closely you have ants that are walking some to and some fro and the guys who are walking fro are walking towards the nest carrying what looks like a if a human being were to carry an eight by four piece of plywood on his back they carry on their mandibles these pieces of vegetation which are many times their size and they take them back to the nest. And of course, for a long, long time, it was thought that they do this because they eat the leaves. They're just taking their, they go gather the lunch and they take it back and they eat the lunch. Not so. <laughs> what happens is, probably most of you know, is that they masticate and chew on these bits of vegetation, fill them up with their saliva and sometimes with fecal material and put them on surfaces which are sort of like bunch of uh, this, this uh, eaten up uh, herbal stuff, which they seed with fungi, which they've been growing. The, the fungi have been growing on just this material, and they are uh, the inoculum. They are the seed, if you were, for the new uh, material. Then, after the fungi grow, that's what they eat. <laughs> they are not vegetarian, they're fungivores. They don't eat the plants at all, despite what, what would seem to be logical and intuitive, but it's not true. They eat the fungi. And so the fungi are the sole source of food for most of these ants. If you eat something else as well, but most of them do that. The queen, the workers, all the cats of the ants live on that. Now, the, this resembles agriculture. And this kind of agriculture was invented by the evolution of ants and fungi together about, what, 50 million years ago, probably in somewhere in the New World, in the Amazon Basin, it is thought. Okay. Now, there is a problem. There are several problems. First of all, the fungi, most of these fungi would, uh, are fungi that make mushrooms. Now, if you were to let these guys grow and grow out into mushrooms, the ants couldn't eat them. Mm. That's not what they eat. So in order to keep these guys from making mushrooms, they prune them, essentially. So here you have human agriculture at work. You prepare the ground, you seed it, you fertilize it. As I said, they use some fecal material for that. And you prune it. Okay? And then eventually you harvest it and eat it. Now, that's all very nice and good. In fact, by the way, it's of interest for mycologists in many ways, but one of them is that the fungi grow into structures called glondidia, which are different than the usual mycelium. So they differentiate into something a little bit different. It's just sort of globular things. Anyhow, one of the problems that arises is that this rich, chewed up, fertilized material Sounds like it's a good substrate for anything, bacteria, fungi, and so forth. And it is. And there are some fungi which like that just as much as those which are eaten by the, by the ants. This one, particularly, which is particularly um, efficient at that, is called Escovopsis. And if you let Escovopsis do its thing, you end up with fungi that the ants cannot eat. They starve. Okay. So what do they do? They have on them a bacterium, 
which is part of their body, cuticle essentially. There are holes in the cuticle or pits in the cuticles which are full of this bacteria, which are actinomycetes. In fact, from the genus Pseudonocardia. In Pseudonocardia, of course, uh, actinomycetes are famous for making antibiotics. And sure enough, this guy makes a specific antibiotic towards this organism, Escovopsis, the parasitic fungus. Okay? Now, that doesn't grow on trees, and I'm surprised that I haven't heard already that some pharmaceutical company hasn't gotten a hold of this and made and looked for specific antifungal against, against specific species. Now, maybe this fungus is of no medical interest, but the principle is interesting that there are fungi, there are bacteria rather, which make antifungal agents which are highly specific towards certain, certain groups of fungi gives a whole new meaning to the word selection and uh -huh. how how these ants knew nothing of microbiology yet <laughs> they're performing an enrichment culture to select out the right microbe that is able to effectively protect their food source and most importantly they're designing a custom antibiotic that only affects the pest that they want to get rid of they they didn't do what us humans have done and and you know use small nuclear weapons to take out the bacteria and the fungi where we principally have used broad spectrum antibiotics that kill indiscriminately these clever little ants used a very specific one that's specifically going after this one fungus that is actually impacting on their food source it's it's really the if you will the designer pesticide that's right that's right, exactly. So this is interesting, and I, I'm surprised, as I say, to, to, maybe it's being followed up, and just haven't heard about it, but um, it's a, from an evolutionary point of view, it, is, it actually makes demands which are quite interesting. It looks like the, fungi, the ants and the fungi arose by coevolution. In other words, the, when these ants first arose, apparently they already had very soon that after they had this relationship with the fungi. So the fungi and the ants have a coevolution. In fact, they can superimpose almost their uh, phylogenies because they're different varieties. And they all have a similar dendrogram, a similar tree. And uh, so that's really fascinating. And it's true also for the parasite, for Escovopsis, which seems also to have arisen quite early. And so it's a delicate balance because the Escovopsis doesn't get killed out. It's not, it hasn't disappeared, it's still there. So there is a balance here between all these various things that go on. And it's even more complicated because in addition to these three players, notice the three players, the fungus, the, um, the uh, ant, the fungus, and the bacterium, uh, you, you may also say the plant is part of the picture, of course. There is a, another element, there is a black yeast. Black yeast are the group of yeast that make black colonies. And this one actually affects the bacterium, the pseudonocardia. So there's a delicate balance there. Sometimes the fungus uh, is over, overgrown by Escovopsis because the bacterium that kills the Escovopsis is itself killed by the, by the black yeast. Now, obviously, the system works because this, these uh, uh, colonies of these ants are humongous. They are tens of yards across sometimes. They can live as much as 10 years. That's because the queen runs out of eggs. Uh, the queen can make, I think, a billion eggs or something like that. I've forgotten what the number is, but huge number of them. That's why they run out. And let me tell you how big these colonies can be. They harvest as much as a kilogram a day of leaves. That's mm -hmm. a lot. Okay. And so in Brazil, where this is a problem, they, uh, this is called, I forgot, the suava, sauva, sauva. And they say either Brazil gets rid of the sauva or the sauva would get rid of Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the case because these, these gardeners probably serve a useful function somewhere, somehow, in the development of... Does the fungus grow inside the uh, the ant colony? Is that how it works? 
yeah, this is right. I'm sorry, I didn't make it clear. This fungus gardens, which are what they are, the are are within the colony. The colony has a lot of chambers with air mm-hmm. in them. These chambers is a spongy stuff. It's like sponge actually, so grayish, blackish. And that's where the fungi grow. Mm. And the the pseudonocardia, they they grow on the ant, right? Do they also grow on the fungus to protect it from the parasite, or is that is it stay on the ant and somehow it's producing these antibiotics and, and getting onto the, the fungus? Good question. I don't know. Yeah. I've seen that. I don't think I've seen that the nocardia grows on the fungus. I don't know. Okay. So the fungus, um, what does it get out of this? Nothing. It gets eaten, right? Oh, it gets eaten, but meanwhile it grows. Yeah, but yeah. that's that's a mutualism. You you get eaten at some point. It's okay. <laughs> well, you you. It's all about reproduction. You you live to the next millennia. Uh, these things are fifteen mil, million years old, so they've obviously done something right. Yeah, I suppose. But it's funny to call it a mutualism when you get eaten. The biomass of the f- infinitely larger than it would be without the ants. I suppose. Maybe some of the fungus escapes and can go live somewhere else too. The, the look, the ants know that, and when the queen goes on her f- nuptial flights, before g- leaving, she gathers some of the fungus and puts it in a special pouch she has. So if she didn't, if she didn't do that, there'd be no. Hmm. Yes, and by the way, this is true for the. This story is true for the uh, fungus growing ants, and it's very similar to what happens to termites. Mm-hmm. So uh, Curry has worked on aspects of this whole mutualism his career, right? Is that is that the story? That's right. Yeah, he's a light in this. So there are other people involved. Yeah. So you know, it's 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 a, it's a hot subject. It's great. It's a great story. I love it. And the chapter is easy to get at. It's accessible, right? Oh, very easy to read. Sure. Okay. So well, thank you very much, Michael. Which one did you read? I I picked up on. Uh, uh, the story by John Roth, and it was entitled How Bacteria Revealed Darwin's Mistake and Got Me to Read on the Origin of Species. That's effectively what John said, is, and got me, me as John. Um, and what caught my eye first was the good use of a proper topic sentence. And the first paragraph of, of, this, uh, mon- uh, of this essay is, Classic science papers and books are often cited, but seldom read. <laughs> so true. <laughs> and uh, the story is um, really pretty elegant. Um, he, he starts out by asking a series of, of uh, very profound questions. For example, what is the origin of mutation? And he he weaves this this wonderful narrative, talking about Darwin and arg and Darwin's arguments that natural selection requires a steady s- injection of new in- new changes in the information set, and without the influx of new information, um, e- effectively everything grinds to a halt because. Natural selection will kill the bad versions of each gene, leaving the good behind, and effectively evolution will come to a grinding halt. You've achieved perfection, and you have game over, no change. And then, of course, when you have the ultimate species that has been adapted to a particular situation and it's perfect, obviously there would be no way to change. And so… What, what John describes in, in this short essay is a conundrum he, he came across, and um, he was engaged in a debate on the origins of mutations, and his conclusions contradicted um, something that was attributed to Darwin. So he was really troubled that his views were in, in direct conflict with uh, Darwin. And so he set out to go after and try to decipher and how best to uh, get at uh, this uh, whole concept of 
if you will, inheritance. And he makes the argument that uh, Darwin, of course, did not know about inheritance. This uh, was uh, new to him. And the argument was is that mutations were arising as a consequence uh, of stress in the population because, again, of where Darwin was when he came to his epiphany on, on the Galapagos, where you had epiphany these... Epiphany was all over the place, but okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm specifically bringing up the example. Um, he knew about the mutants that had these large phenotypic changes that appeared, if you will, in these domesticated plants and animals. And in the case of the Galapagos, it was an island, and, which is the equivalent of a domesticated situation where you can have these, and the quote is, freaks or sports uh, that were often not seen in natural populations, which I always interpreted to be open, you know, not sub subjected to the forces of island pressure. But the point, the main point is that Darwin thought that the origin of, uh, the, the, the driving force was stress. Right. Stress causes a response, and the response is selected for, right? Mm -hmm. You need stress in order to get uh, an influx or a variation in the species that then can adapt to that stress. And uh, he makes the argument that Darwin could have really used bacteria um, because we can, of course, measure uh, the mutation rates. And then the transition comes in. Whereas he's laid out this very elegant uh, preamble describing uh, Darwin and looking at the astronomical population effects of, of bacteria that can be grown without stress and their mutation types can be characterized. He describes then the work of very of three very famous geneticists, uh, Letterberg, Luria, and Delbrook. That showed that mutations can form without any required stress. And this is, the, of course, the famous Letterberg uh, selection technique in which the principal hypothesis is, is that the community or the population has a mutation before the selection pressure is applied and then through multiple generations with a constant an absolute selection. And in the case of Letterbird selection, it was life or death because it was effectively selecting for resistance to an antibiotic. The mute then becomes the, the dominant um, member in the population. And so you can literally pick it out from a population of billions of, of living bacteria simply by your naked eye uh, and this is, of course, the evolution of the replica plating technique in order to um, hunt up mutations and be able to find uh, mutant cells within a population. Uh, believe it or not, uh, excuse me for interrupting, Michael, uh, I was around then. <laughs> I was around <laughs> when this argument this happened. And the, the big argument was that um, if you just select something, you have done the selection in the presence of the substance that is relevant, the antibiotic or the phage, in the case of phage resistance. So how do you know that it wasn't that which caused the mutation? The big argument was that it was sort of a neo-Lamarckianism. If you remember, Lamarck proposed that mutations arise as a result of the environment itself. Mm. So people say, how can, you, how can you distinguish between the two things? just because you just finished adding, uh, doing the experiment in, in the presence of the selective agent. So the beauty of Lederberg's experiment is that in the replica plating thing, he has a master plate which never saw antibiotics. Correct. When you replicate it onto the antibiotic-containing plate, you find the rare colony that grows, then you go back to the master plate and you pick it up, mm -hmm. and you find that all those cells are resistant. Right? And What's really clever is that you don't actually what the for those of you not familiar with replica plating, you literally have a lawn of bacteria on the petri plate as your master plate. It's literally wall to wall bacteria, 
And it's so it's just like the lawn in front of your house. And you go back and you see um, the way one does replica plating is you have this lawn of bacteria and you can actually take a, a piece of Kleenex. And if you just imagine dropping a piece of Kleenex over a soda can and then placing a Petri plate um, on top of the Kleenex with the master bacteria on it, and then you remove it off, you remove it, and some of the bacteria are in the precise location on this piece of Kleenex. Letterberg used to velvet, but today you can get away with Kleenex or if you're lucky and you don't want to uh, uh, do laundry, you use Kleenex or you can use these beautiful little pieces of, of velveteen. And then you take a plate that has the selective pressure on it and you place it on top, noting the orientation, and then you incubate it and you see where the colony has developed. Then you go back to the original plate and you literally drill a hole into the auger and you pull out not one organism but many. You place it into a liquid broth. You grow it for a defined period of time and obviously it along with all the neighbors that don't have the mutation will multiply and then you ask the question whether or not the mutation has bred true. And again, the way one does this is you plate the bacteria on a Petri plate that has no selective pressure. You get a complete lawn, and then you replicate plate that onto the selective medium, and you can literally count with your finger, understanding the generation time, the time it takes for one bacterium to become two, you can literally assess whether or not the mutation has bred true. And you can even tell how many of the uh, cells in that particular zone. Obviously, it lies on pure culture, uh, the premise of pure culture, where one bacterium becomes a colony. And so if you know in that one region that you selected, there was one mutant cell that it was able to grow at the selective pressure, you, of course, can then calculate uh, the frequency and the generation time for which um, the mutation actually occurred. Now, Luria, Letterberg, and Delbrook were, were the pioneers in, in this classic selection. And... Um, this this troubled John Roth and uh, John Karens, and John went and visited John Karens at Harvard Medical School, and with great excitement, uh, he uh, Karen showed Roth data that was suggesting that Letterberg, Luria, and Delbrook had missed something. Uh, this was uh, pretty heretical; had missed something that. And that Darwin might have been closer to the mark uh, than people realized. And what Roth and Karens were thinking about is that Lederberg and Luria and Delbrook had all used absolute or lethal selections that detected mutants on as colonies on Petri plates. And they initiated the mutant cells that arose well before exposure to selection. When the non-mutant parental cells would hit the selective plate, they died before they could respond to this, uh, this new condition, making it impossible to detect mutations induced by selective co conditions. So what Karen's, the, the quantum leap in Karen's thinking was, is he thought that he would not use a lethal selection. He would uh, simply take a microorganism. In this particular case, he took an E. coli that was unable to use uh, lactose as a carbon source, and he spread these uh, bacteria, these mutant bacterial cells, onto a medium that the mutant cells onto a medium that had lactose as their sole source of carbon. So they're not getting carbon from any other place. So the only way they can grow is that they can adapt to grow on lactose. And so 
over time, and this was about six days, um, a colony appeared. And the argument was that was this was due to a large effect mutation occurring in the non-growing population. And the accumulation of these normally rare uh, LAC plus mutants over time was attributed. And again, it goes back to what Darwin was arguing is that it was stress that was uh, effectively driving mutation. And so now here, Cairns is, is arguing or uh, his experiment is vindicating Darwin that the mutations seem to be induced by stress. And then they posit the question, were the classic experiments that Luria, Delbrook, and Letterbrook done, ha had they missed something or was there something wrong with uh, Karen's system? And this is why I... I by the way, this was, this was high-level heresy. <laughs> there was the, the in, my, in my recollection, certainly... The uh, Delbrook and Luria, as well as the Lederbrook experiments, had laid the question to rest forever. Mutations are spontaneous. They have nothing to do with stress. They just happen in an unstressed population. So here comes Cairns and says the opposite. And he was not that popular, I got to mm -hmm. tell you. You can well imagine this, is, this was in the um, days when, uh, before sequencing, before rapid uh, cloning. Bef I mean, this was old time genetics. But what this manuscript really begins to help people think about is you have to appreciate the fact that both folks are right. Luria Letterberg and Delbrook were right. Uh, mutations are spontaneous. Today, we understand mutations occur as a consequence of the fidelity DNA synthesis and the consequences or lack of consequences of repair mechanisms functioning properly. And if you look at the fidelity of, of DNA synthesis, you find that it's really quite remarkable where if you look at the, the fidelity uh, uh, the base substitution rate of re of the replication machinery in vivo for E. coli or uh, bacteriophage, the mutation rate is 10 to the minus 7th to 10 to the minus 8th. And the way I always think of that, because we're fortunate in that we can have uh, literally 100 million bacteria in, you know, a m couple of 10 microliters, you can have that many. I always look at it, if you looked at the genome of that microbe, and I always round E. coli size up to 5 million base pairs, 10 to the minus 7 means that in that one chromosome of E. coli, you have no errors, but then appreciate the fact that bacteria cheat and they actually have more than one copy of their chromosome in order to be able to divide quickly, um, it really begins to introduce a population of 100 million or so that uh, 10 bacteria will have a mutation in it. Between 1 and 10 bacteria will have a mutation in it if the mutation rate is between 10 to the minus 7th and, and 10 to the minus 8. So then Roth goes on to introduce us to this concept of the importance of these small effect mutations. And this is where I think uh, folks new to genetics and, and new to microbiology and trying to think about selective pressure and, and how to go fishing um, for mutants, it, it's always about the selection condition. Uh, Letterberg, Lurie, and Delbrook were really fortunate that they used lethal selections because it made the interpretation of their results so much simpler. Uh, when you don't use a lethal mutation, it's when you really have to design your selection so that you can make some sense of the data. And here's where Karen's introduced some fun facts for you to think about. Um, 
the commonest mutations are transitions where you have an A to a T or a G to a C. And this occurs in about a third of the mutations that are caused by the lack of fidelity and repair. And if you think about it, because the genetic code is redundant, we have a 64 box genetic code and it's redundant because there's only uh, 21 amino acids. And so you can appreciate that many of the mutations will be synonymous. That is, they will substitute the incorporate the same amino acids because the mutation a different codon different codon. A different codon Roth goes on to then introduce us to um, the other frequent mutations where he introduces us to the notion that gene copy number where the microorganism will actually duplicate the gene and so now you can well imagine looking at the uh, fidelity of DNA repair and, and uh, replication, if you have a duplicate gene and the mutation that you make is bad because you have a good copy because of the duplication event, the selective pressure is not going to be as uh, profound. And so consequently, you can then begin to accumulate these mutations, whether they be in proteins or whether they be in control circuits that can regulate entire uh, regulons or operons or all of the other wonder, wondrous uh, control elements that uh, bacteria have. And so as you begin to think about changes in gene copy number, whether they go up or whether they go down, the frequency at which this happens is approximately 10 to the minus 2 per cell division, which means for every 1 in 100 cells, you are going to see this event. And so the argument then is made is that perhaps 10% of new chromosomal copies carry duplication somewhere. So now you can begin to see how that LAC minus cell sitting on a Petri plate where the only carbon source is lactose is able to accumulate with time. It's not growing and dividing, but it's able to accumulate um, these events. So eventually it will be able to select out because it's going to be cannibalizing itself and it's really not dead on the plate. It's just sitting there. And that's why you begin to see these micro colonies. What micro colonies? Point here is that Cairns was fooled, right? Yeah. Well, there's still residual arguments. <laughs> and, uh, it's not, it's not, <laughs> Decided for all times. You would think, I mean, if you talk to John Roth, he thinks the argument is settled, but apparently there's, it gets it gets woolly, and I'm, I'm not sure I, I can tell you why, but uh, in, in most people's minds, I would say there's a great acceptance of the Roth explanation, which is very elegant yeah. and believable. So. Okay. so the microcolonies that you see arising on Cairn's relaxed selection, these are the small effective mutants initiate these clones, he's got on day four, he's got these tiny little colonies beginning to arise. And then, of course, you have the, the bigger colonies uh, appearing. And so what his argument is, is that um, you get this accumulation of small effect mutations arise at a very high rate and that there's an inverse relationship between the rate at which the mutation arises and the magnitude of its phenotypic effect. So obviously, mm -hmm. if you have a small promoter effect, and we understand well the, the LAC system, and we know that the LAC system has both positive and negative control points. Uh, the this is beta galactosidase, right? This is beta galactosidase. So in the case of um, the positive control element, you, of course, recall that you need high levels of cyclic AMP 
in order to activate the catabolite activator protein, which then will bind the DNA upstream of um, the LAC promoter system to facilitate RNA polymerase entry. And if this site, which is typically about, if I'm remembering properly, about minus 80 upstream, uh, and if that particular site uh, mutates such that the now the RNA polymerase can melt in to the nucleic acid, the DNA, in order to synthesize the LAC message, or you change the repressor, the catab- uh, not the repressor, the activator, the, so that it no longer needs a particular level of uh, cyclic AMP, you can well imagine all the variations that you can get in order to to facilitate LAC expression or how they had uh, obtained LAC minus mutants that they ultimately originally plated in order or Cairns originally plated in order to see this effect. Now, as I understand it, this has not quite settled the issue for all times. Uh, there are still people. There's still an argument going on in, with some labs, and I haven't followed that. But uh, I would think that most people are quite satisfied with the Rothian explanation, aren't they? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's 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 the current thing. But the, the, there are wrinkles to it, and it's, it it sounds like a really incredible fact that they, you can argue about this for a long, long time, <laughs> can't you? It yeah. Goes on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, and. And I'll finish up here. The the take-home points uh, that Roth brings up to us on on his reading of Origin, he revealed uh, to him both good news and bad. And I'll read from it. Darwin's idea of stress-induced mutation may be wrong, but natural selection can take on breathtaking power when common small-effect mutations are allowed to contribute. These effects are revealed by bacterial populations. Under selection, the high speed of genetic adaptation is easily mistaken for an increase in mutation rate. Maybe even Darwin underestimated the power of selection. Readers should be aware that despite John Roth's confidence that the above interpretation is right, the idea of stress-induced mutagenesis is still strongly defended. Science is funny that way. And I think if you if you reflect on on the concepts of this essay and really take it back to to selection and and I started thinking about this um, because of all of the things going on with the microbiome, where we have uh, this really complex and dynamic population interacting and also interacting with us as a host. It, it's very similar to the first story that Elio talked about, where you had an ant, you had a fungus, you had a bacterium, and you had leaves, and everyone is getting something out of it. But what is driving the process is selection, and it's the community in total that is really what evolution is operating on. It's no single one thing. It's really the collective that evolution is operating on. And microbiologists are more fortunate than individuals working on bigger animals because we can have so many of them in such a small place and we can select out and pick with our finger that one unique individual literally out of 100 million different individuals on a particular bacterial colony or petri plate good the idea that stress could increase mutation is good so why not right that could be a good response um yeah well it certainly sounds intuitively that it could happen right but uh as i say john john has good good solid data that it's it's a case-by-case thing you see the point is john does a thing about the particular experiment that was carried out by by Cairns and by others. Uh, other situations may be different, sure. and so it's not you can't solve the argument forever. Right. It's just it's an ongoing argument, and it's it's probably going to be that way. Yeah. That's why he says science is funny like that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. He's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Nice. Nice job. 
All right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the last one is uh, a chapter I picked by Forrest Rower. It is called Phage, an important evolutionary force Darwin never knew. I think it's the only chapter involving viruses in this book. Is it really? I, th I looked oh through God. them all. Yeah, it's the one I picked because uh, it's viruses, <laughs> you know. But uh, it probably should be more. But anyway, it's a good one. And he, um, it's very interesting, his career. He, he studied molecular immunology as a graduate student. And he said back then he thought that evolution was done. We understood everything about it. Um, and then he said he started out hang, hanging out with microbiologists, and he heard a talk by Farouk Azam where, they, where he said, there are 10 million phage per milliliter of seawater. <laughs> and that's in the, in the early 90s. So he thought that was really cool. And um, he went and he worked uh, for, <laughs> for Azam. And while he was there... Uh, they just de they decided to sequence one of these uh, phages from the ocean, um, and in fact, it turns out to be a roseophage. And and these roseobacters, that's the host of this phage. You remember we talked about? Oh yes. Yep. In terms of the symbiosis with E. Hux, right? That's right. So they sequenced this phage genome, and um, he said the surprise was most of the genes were not related to anything that anybody had ever seen. But there was one set of genes, he calls it a module, which was clearly involved in DNA replication. It had a DNA polymerase, it had a helicase, and an endonuclease. So Rower says this got him to start reading the work of, of David Botstein, Graham Hatful, Roger Hendricks, and Jeff Lawrence, who had the idea that uh, evolution proceeds by the creation of mosaics. So phages can recombine and exchange modules of genes, uh, and this gives rise to mosaicism. So this got him really interested in this whole idea. The genome is a mosaic of a phage, is a mosaic from different phages. So he started thinking about the numbers. If there's a you know, million phages, 10 million phages per mil of seawater, that's 10 to the 31st phage on the planet. <laughs> Huge number. So he, he did some thought experiments, and he said when a phage infects a cell, there's probably another phage already in the cell integrated into the genome, and these phages have a conflict, so they start to chop up each other's DNA. And so then there's all these pieces of DNA floating around in the infected cell, so what you get out is a, is a bunch of recombinants who then go out into the world and try and, and get selected and see who wins. Quite an elegant way of putting it, huh? Yeah, it's great. Um, so... He said, we have to find out what, what's out there. What are all the phages and what are all their genes? And he calls it the virome. <clears throat> he wanted to measure the virome of the world. And he says, now this is not easy to do because, and interestingly, he says, the first problem being most of the microbial hosts are not easy to culture, which is something we've talked about a lot here on TWIM. And he said, even if you could culture them, it would be really hard to grow up all the phages that are in the oceans and sequence them. Yeah, imagine if you could, you know, you'd, you'd keep about a million microbiologists working 24 <laughs> hours a day. That's right, for a long time. You know, it'd be endless. Yes. <laughs> well, right. let me ask, ask you this, Vincent, and, and maybe our listeners who are, are phage aficionados, what percent of phage are lysogenized with the, ho the host genome and would brute force sequencing of as many host genomes then allow us to indirectly find the virome mm -hmm. more easily? Yeah. I, well, I, I, I think I know a partial answer. The, the larger number of the viruses in the ocean are actually lytic viruses. Yeah. But the, even a small proportion of them being lysogenic is still a huge number. Right. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. So you would get some of it, but not all, and not the majority, because as Elio says, most of them are lytic. Yeah. So the other problem, of course, is that there's no signature for phages. So in back in the microbiome, we use ribosomal DNA to characterize them, but you can't do that for phages. So he says this made us think hard about uh, what we could do, and that, and then he came up with this uh, idea of uncultured. Sequencing uncultured material. 
So you don't grow up the viruses. You just you just sequence the DNA in toto, and um, this led to the whole field now of viral metagenomics. You clone pieces of uncultured viruses and you sequence them. So the first thing he did was to go where he works in San Diego. He's right near you, Alio, right? He's in the yeah, San, he's San Diego State. San Diego State. He's right down the hall from you, actually. Well, no, I. Well, <laughs> yes, okay, sort of. <laughs> well, you're at home now, but you, you know what I mean. So he goes out into the seawater off the coast of San Diego and did some sampling. Which there's lots. There's plenty of that. And his first paper, 2002 PNAS paper, they did the the uh, gene, the viral metagenome. Uh, off this coast, and he finds that less than 20% of the sequences, so he's going for phage sequences, have any similarity to what's known before. So he's learning all new sequences by doing this. And if and he then compares it to microbiome sequences where a higher proportion of the genes are known. So he says, most of the uncharacterized genomic diversity on our planet is in uh, the viruses. It's actually it's true by far. By far. I mean, the numbers are gigantic, aren't they? Yeah, so he estimates there are 2.5 billion novel phage encoded genes on Earth that are yet to be discovered. Mamma mia. Mamma mia, yeah. So is, is that then the genetic repository of the planet? You know, so if we do have, to take a piece from Darwin's argument, if we have stress, we go off to the viruses to see if they have a solution for us? Well, that's, that's what he gets to next. That's exactly what he's getting to next, and I will, I will get into that. But before I do, he says, I sincerely hope there are even more phage encoded genes on Europa. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is a, is a moon of Jupiter that has ice and oxygen and could have life. But didn't Stanley Kubrick or Arthur C. Clarke tell us we shouldn't go there? No, well, we are. Apparently, there's a probe <laughs> being launched in about 10 years. And we're going to see a monolith. Yeah, form monolith will be there. <laughs> so anyway, getting back to your point, uh, Michael. So he says, yes, this this is this huge gene pool has incredible potential because these genes can be pushed all over the place into different hosts. So he brings up the example of bacterial pathogens. Could these genes in the phage pool make new bacterial pathogens? He makes the point that um, a lot of these pathogens have toxin genes. And they can be uh, shuffled around from bacteria to bacteria by, by phages. Uh, so he, in 2001, again went off the coast of San Diego and looked for uh, exotoxin genes uh, in, in the phage population. And he looked at she for Shiga toxin, he looked for cholera toxin, he looked for a staph enterotoxin A. And for diphtheria toxins. So again, he's you, you got to admit this is this is chutzpah, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's amazing. You go figure, they're gonna find that in the ocean. Right. So wow, you, again, what an unlikely story, right? He takes the phage DNA and he just looks for these, uh, and he found that ten percent of the samples had at least one of these toxin <laughs> genes. It's amazing. Amazing. So they're moving all over the world, and you and as he says, given this pool, we can never eliminate uh, these reservoirs of human diseases. Another cool thing he talks about is a study he did uh, with with Matt Sullivan from the Chisholm Lab at MIT. They sequenced a phage that infects Prochlorococcus, which is one of the cyanobacteria. And these bacteria, of course, do photosynthesis in a big way. And when they sequenced this genome, they found this phage genome, the phage that infects Prochlorococcus, they found genes involved in photosynthesis. So they said, oh, we must have screwed up. We must have contaminated the DNA with, with host DNA, right? Because that's where the photosynthesis genes are supposed to be. But it turned out to be right. And in fact, uh, the phage carries a gene called PSBA. And this gene product allows photosynthesis to continue as the phage is killing the host. <laughs> it's amazing. So, That's having your cake and eating it too. Exactly, because you still want the photosynthesis to go on. The virus. Well, you need the you need the energy and yeah. you need the reducing equivalents in order to make more phage. Right, right, right. right. So there you are. This so, is really so crazy. Um, he's been doing uh, this this viral metagenomic sequencing for a long time, and he says now um, we have a really big database of uh, viral genes. And what's interesting is 
Compared to microbes, the phage genes are enriched in very interesting functions, and these include nucleic acid metabolism, uh, metabolism of vitamins, cofactors, cell wall metabolism, capsule synthesis, virulence factors, stress response genes, and chemo, chemotaxis genes. So phage don't just have genes that we would normally say they need, like DNA replication genes or capsidation genes. They have other things as well. And what they're for, who knows? Obviously, they're there for a reason, but they're also a huge uh, repository as well. Um, so the, the conclusion here basically is that um, this, this evolution, the phage microbial evolution, is, is far more rapid and dynamic than, than Darwin could imagine. Phages bring genes all over the world. Uh, they change the uh, evolution of microbes by introducing these genes, and they change the phenotypes of the host. And so the let me, let me ask yeah let me ask a question yeah um, I wanted to ask this of a virologist <laughs> if vir if we didn't know about the existence of viruses could anybody conjure them up wow, it seems to me that the answer is equivocal at least I mean, who could dream this up yeah often we say you can never you couldn't even invent this stuff that goes on right right exactly it's a tough question it's, though because we know too much to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's not a question. It's a <laughs> so the last sentence is great. Most of the evolution on the planet is actually being carried out by entities Darwin never imagined, and at a scale he never could have considered. Oh. That's it. Yeah. So that's your question, Alia. Could you ever have imagined it? And the numbers are phenomenal. Ten to the thirty-first phages. Well, you've heard the 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 way to present that number. If you line up all the phages on Earth head to tail, they would go 200 million light years into space. <laughs> huge number, 200 million light years. And these things are only a nanometer in size. Can't, or... <laughs> can't even see them. They're going farther than we've been. Anyway, it's a great uh, little collection. Check it out. We'll put links to some of this stuff. Um, I really recommend it. Good beach reading, as Michael says. All right, we have a couple of emails uh, we'll, we'll read before we wrap up here. One is from Mary Yule. Uh, Alio's collaborator over at Small Things Considered, who writes, writing this sprint event for the Microbial Olympics published recently by Nature Reviews Microbiology was surely my most fun writing assignment ever. The idea for this feature article originated with Dr. Andrew Jermy, senior editor at NRM in London, back when the city was just starting to hum with preparations for the Summer Olympics. He invited Forrest Rower and myself to cover one of the events. Fortunately, he offered us the sprint, which was a perfect opportunity for my favorite entrance, the phage, to win. He also enticed me by clearly stating his intent that this was to be a fun piece for the reader and the authors alike. Because my name happens to be first on the article, rumors have been going around that this was my idea. Actually, this was but the latest of a series of innovative features he has put together. I look forward to the next one. Well, it may not have been her invention, but she could have turned this up. Yeah. Mary is, is a wonderful way of, of thinking about things. Yep. As you have learned, right? Yeah, as I, <laughs> my benefit. <laughs> we have a letter from James. Actually, it's James Gurney, one of the authors of the Microbial Olympics. Hello, Twim. I just wanted to write you guys and th say thanks for highlighting our Nature Reviews article, or Microbial Olympics. I'm glad our approach of writing a piece that could be appreciated by experts and laypersons alike was successful. And as it's my first outing into the publication world, I'm thrilled it has received such positive feedback. Thanks again. Nice. Uh, we also have a letter from Jim who writes another wonderful twim. Joe Handelsman's credentials are more impressive by the week. Well, Joe, you're not here to hear that. Oh boy, is it ever true. I will apologize for my lowbrow humor in the letter you read. So last time we read a letter from, from Jim, and I didn't quite understand what he meant. But now he says, taking a dump is used to say having a bowel movement. Hence, dump data would be data derived from the study of uh, bowel movement. So now oh, I understand. Now I we understand. You guys remember, I didn't get this. He was paying us either. a compliment. He was. And he also apologies to Alan Dove, who's my colleague on TWIV, and Alan is great with the puns. And so that's now it's very clear, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> we also have one from Stanley who writes, this is Stanley Malloy, 
also your neighbor, our friend, our friend and neighbor. Our friend. So, so maybe it was because I was irritated from sitting in a traffic jam in L.A., or maybe like Elio, I was just being an old curmudgeon as I was parked <laughs> on the freeway listening to Twim and looking forward to accelerating through Elio and Michael's autobahn through the oh. recent general meeting of the American Society of Microbiology. Their comments made me feel stuck in an intellectual roadblock. Elio made a good point that when a field gets started, it begins with a lot of ideas, then goes through a period of accumulating a lot of data before finally maturing into a robust blend of ideas, data, and broad insights that lead to interesting, testable predictions. But research on the microbiome is not just stuck in the boring burial in data phase. The field began with learning about a small number of cases to learn who is there and trying to guess from the sequences what are they doing, work that was important to build the foundation of microbiome studies. And it is true that there is a lot of that still going on in labs around the world. But the research has also progressed to other broader questions, like how does the microbiome change after treatment with antibiotics, and how long does it take to recover? How does diet influence the microbiome? Is a person's microbiome stable, or does it change over time? Do certain microbes in the microbiome seem to protect against particular diseases? Questions that both make us think about the role of microbes in our health and illness, and data that leads to testable predictions that can lead to new therapeutics and treatments. For example, probiotics have been around for a long time, but we didn't understand how they work, and in some cases didn't even have good evidence that they really do work. Likewise for old age treatments like fecal transplant. In short, this is a very exciting time for the microbiome, and if you're willing to listen and think, a fun time to be in the audience learning about the new discoveries. If you'd like to hear from some of the people who spoke at the ASM, as well as some perspectives on the future of this work, check out the ASM Life Interviews from the General Meeting, and he provides a link to that on microbeworld.org. Thanks for the cerebral distraction from the bumper in front of me, Stanley. <laughs> well, uh, he sort of talks about something I said, so I should answer. And, uh, you know, I, I, would, I wouldn't argue with this. I, th I think he's right that this is an exciting field. Uh, it's just that being in the audience is a matter of taste. You know, I just as soon wait another year or two. But he's, he's right. I mean, it's an important subject. I didn't mean to make slight of that. And so we're okay. We're okay. I think we all said the same thing. I, I think everybody agreed it was exciting. It's just our approach to explaining it is a, is a little different. Um, yeah. And we, we've gotten a, a few emails on this. And so obviously, as uh, commentators on what happened at the medium, we piqued everyone's curiosity. And I think that's what we're trying to do is, is to get everybody to think about it and to reflect. And that's what really moves science along is, is the reflection. Right. I thought you were going to say we peed somebody's curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. Anyhow, well, maybe these life, okay. these life interviews that he's pointing to, they, it's a different perspective because these are people discussing the, right, the, the implications, right. not just giving the data. So that's probably sure. more interesting. Right? Right. Yeah. Uh, we have a letter from Joe who writes, I wanted to follow up to an email that I sent to you all a while ago about evolution and entropy and my sense of paradox regarding the ever-increasing complexity of biologic systems and their concentration of energy in spite of the overriding natural continual dispersal of energy captured in the idea of entropy. Let me first say that one of my gifts as a scientist and engineer is an ability and willingness to ask fuzzy questions about bigger concepts at the boundaries of my knowledge looking for unexpected insights. Usually these questions are not quite so fuzzy that I mistake two for three, as in the laws of thermodynamics. I guess I just like Gibbs free energy more than entropy. That effort to identify what we don't know, that we don't know, is what has always excited me about science, the chance to think an entirely new thought that reveals something new about nature. How cool is that? I appreciated that Michael and the rest of the crew tried to tackle the question in the spirit that it was offered, and his answer 
essentially pointing out that nature arrives at complexity through massively large numbers of trial, was useful after I thought about it for a while. Yet I must say that it still did not quite get at the core of my question. I was surprised by the email responses to my question that you later read, particularly by the person who all but accused me of being (laughs) an evil creationist. I will just say that since it is not an issue that I care about, I suspect the assertion says more about his worldview than my own. The phrase evolution driven by random chance has never seemed to capture the awesome sense of inevitability and thoroughness that I see in evolution. To me, that phrase seems equivalent to calling it magic. Since then, I have come across a much more complete answer to what underlies this drive to complexity in Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near, which I recommend as an interesting read whether you agree with his thesis or not. On page 85, he references research done by Stephen Wolfram on cellular automatons. This is a mathematical study that describes how complex non-repetitive patterns can be generated from digital systems with a few very simple rules. In particular, there is a category called Class IV automata that appear to characterize the evolution of biological systems. I have picked up Wolfram's book, A New Kind of Science, and even though I am but a few pages in, it appears to be a very promising brain stretcher. Assuming I don't injure my back lifting it, I will let you know if it addresses my questions about the underlying drivers in evolution. In closing, let me say that I appreciate all the great work you are doing on all three podcasts. I value the dialogue, spontaneity, and asides, and believe that you all capture the emotional enthusiasm that makes science such a great life's work. Isn't that nice? Wow. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that um, here, here. Uh, we, this is actually relevant to the, your chapter today, Michael. Yeah. In many ways. All right, Joe, let us know how a new kind of science works out for you when you finish. It sounds like a long book. All right. The last email for today is from Peter, who writes, greetings, Twim team. I saw these instructions on instructables.com for culturing bioluminescent bacteria from fresh sea fish and thought they may be of interest. For those not familiar with it, Instructables is a very eclectic do-it-yourself site where people can publish instructions for various projects they have done. This is actually quite amazing. This is a very, very long and involved uh, do-it-yourself guide for how to get uh, (laughs) Vibrio out of fish and grow them in your home so that they can glow and you can be fascinated by that. And it's very detailed. It's really quite amazing. So for those of us who have worked in labs, we will find this amusing. And for those of us who have not, it probably would work. So thanks for that, Peter. That's that's pretty neat. Either of you ever looked at uh, Instructables? I do it every year when I get the request from the high school science fair kids who call me up asking me if I have any good yeah, ideas. Yeah. And you find them there, yeah. It's a good idea. Well, it, you, you have to make it approachable because they don't have labs like we have labs. And, uh, you know, I, I, I tip my hat to folks who, who make our science accessible yeah. to anyone who's curious. Yep. And I think bioluminescence uh, is so cool. There's not one of us that hasn't chased a firefly. Uh, and oh, yeah. captured it in, you know, the the famous Funkin Wagnail, no, not the the mayonnaise jar that used to sit on Johnny Carson's porch. <laughs> you know, yeah, this is a cool site. People will like this. And the this bioluminescent bacteria is just great. I loved it. So check that out. Thanks for that, Peter. And that wraps up Twim thirty nine. You can find us on iTunes and at microbeworld.org slash twim. If you do use iTunes, please subscribe. The more that uh, everyone subscribes, the the greater chance we have of being featured on the front page so that more people can find us. And if you leave a comment or a rating there, that helps us a lot as well. Uh, We love to get your questions and comments. Please uh, send them to twim at twiv.tv. Elio Schechter is at the wonderful blog Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. 
My pleasure, of course. Did you enjoy discussing uh, this book today? Was it something different? Oh, I sure did. No, this was a lot of fun. A blast. Yep. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. Another great twim with fun topics. Always fun, yes. This, this microbial world is just so much fun. It's just great. We are, we are really lucky to be able to talk about it. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at my blog, which is at virology.ws. Many thanks to the American Society for Microbiology for supporting Twin Communications Director Barbara Hyde and Chris Kondayan and Ray Ortega for their high-tech help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 